So good afternoon, everyone. everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Lucy Wild. I'm the Account Director at Axial. I'm part of the Specialist Sales Team for Sky High. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of Axial and our partnership with Sky High, and then I'm going to hand over to Nigel Hawthorne from Sky High. So who are Axial Systems? We are a leading UK solutions provider, and we deliver business value to our customers through technology solutions. So what does this mean in real terms? Uh, we are helping our customers, who are typically large enterprises, to retain their customers, improve their business agility, manage their costs, protect their data, and meet any regulatory compliances. Um, and we do this in three key areas. The technology areas we specialize in are network management solutions and data security. With network management, we help networks and ensure the right information gets to the right tools. We give our customers the ability to spot problems and fix them before they impact the business. With data security, we're helping our clients to protect their data at every level, from the data center through to the cloud and mobile devices. We're protecting their business, and doing this, they achieve the necessary regulatory compliances. The third area, and this is what really sets Axial apart, are the services we provide. We provide a full range of services that complement our technology solutions. These range from training, installation, planning and design, right through to full managed services. And this is what makes Axial really special and one of the things that I love most about our company. It's our ability to take multiple vendors and with our services put together complete solutions tailored to our clients' individual needs. We've always provided ourselves innovation to our customers and we couldn't do this without partnering with our strategic vendors. One of these is Sky High Networks, a very important vendor in our data security space. We've been partnering with Sky High for about 18 months now. The partnership came about um, with a fantastic move to the cloud. It's been a really interesting journey to see. And talking to our customers, although it presented amazing business opportunities, um, it also presented challenges. The feedback we were getting was, you know, we want to move to the cloud, but how do we know which services to use? How do we know when we put our data into the cloud how secure it's going to be? How do we ensure we get the same level of security that we have in our data center? And also, what data of ours is already going to the cloud? What are our employees doing that we don't know about? So we looked at the market, and Sky High was an absolutely obvious choice for us. They're the market leader, um, and they really have given Axial the ability to, um, to, act, to look after our customers in this space, both in terms of shadow IT, but also moving forward um, and providing a stable, secure platform as customers move their data into the cloud. So that's probably enough for me. Thank you very much. I'm now going to hand over to Nigel Hawthorne from Sky High Networks. Nigel will be taking questions at the end, and if anyone would like a copy of the slides, please let us know. Over to you, Nigel. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Lucy. So one of the things that Lucy mentioned was regulations, and that's really what today is primarily about. Uh, my background is that throughout most of the companies that I've worked for, I've realized that many of IT's needs are really to make sure that uh, the technology they provide to the users ensures that the companies are conforming to all the different regulations. And uh, I've been watching things like the Data Protection Directive from 1995 all the way up to the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, that was uh, published just uh, a week and a half ago and comes into for uh, 2018. And what I want to lead you through is uh, our action guide for IT, where there's been a lot of material written about GDPR, but a lot of it has come from the legal world. And um, that's great. It really tells you what the law is and how to interpret it. But what I wanted to do is try to give you some practical advice of, okay, what do we need to do to actually make sure that the organization moves forward, what are the first steps that we need to take. So that's what I intend to try to cover today. I probably won't go, go through every single point on every single slide. Uh, one, because I will have the time to read ahead of what I say. Uh, I don't want to bore you to death also because of the amount of time that we've got. But do feel free at any time to type in a question into the questions box, and we'll be looking at them at the end, and uh, we'll cover them before we finish. Any questions that uh, you have any time, feel free to ask them. We may well cover them, but uh, don't wait and think that you'll remember them at the end. It's great to type them in so that we can see how we're going. Um, I will just talk about one piece of news before. If you haven't seen, just I think brings this 
uh, whole um, issue to the forefront of our minds. That uh, on um, Tuesday this week, the ICO fined um, a sexual health clinic £180,000 for revealing the email addresses of 700 users uh, to each other. So what they did was they sent an email to 700 people. They just put all 700 names in the two box of a single email. So everyone got the ability to see the email address of everybody else. A £180,000 fine is £250 per email address lost. So let's think how many data records we have in our own companies. How many employees that you've got and think what you would do if your organization was fined £250 per piece of information that you might lose about your customers, your suppliers and your employees. Um, and that's today, with today's laws, and as you'll see from the rest of the presentation, when the GDPR comes into force, actually the fines can be that much greater. And I was with um, uh, Christopher Graham, the Information Commissioner, uh, at a couple of events this week where he was saying, you know, we need to have this additional capability to make sure that the fines are significant so that we do get um, the attention of boards of senior management. This isn't just an IT issue. If there's just one thing to take out of today's presentation, it's that this is something that really needs to be taken seriously in the whole of the organization. And to be able to make sure that we comply, we need to bring in all the different departments uh, together. It's not just an IT issue and shouldn't be delegated just to information technology. So with that, um, uh, uh, here's the agenda of the sort of things that I'm going to go through. Funnily enough, even the first bullet might be wrong. There's still a little bit of confusion about exactly what day it will uh, uh, come into force. Somewhere in May 20, good enough. Two years, we don't have a huge amount of time to actually put together all the plans that we need to. And then I won't go through the agenda piece by piece, but as I say, um, what we're going to do is talk through a little bit about the law, a little bit about statistics of what we're seeing for cloud use, because my view is that cloud use can easily be the place that you get caught out um, when employees may well be oversharing information. A little bit on how Sky High can help, and then uh, our suggestion for implementing an action plan, which Axial can help you with. So Axial have a great team of people who can come together with you and help you put together your plans to make sure that you comply. So um, the regulation itself, when uh, I got a version in January, was 204 pages. I think the, the final version is now even longer than that. It's, I think, actually well written. Um, it's, it's clear, um, and, uh, but 204 pages is quite a lot. So actually what we've tried to do is boil that down a little bit, and um, I've written a, a paper called An Action Guide for IT. It's only 43 pages of A5, so it is certainly less than uh, 200 pages, but it is intended to go a little bit further than just the law and give you an idea of what you might need to uh, do about it. And at the end of the presentation, you'll see a link to an online PDF version of that. And of course, there'll be a, a thank you email going out to all of you where you can download that. But let's also look at technology because um, I honestly think that we've got to remember all the time that technology can both be our friend and our foe here. Um, can cloud and security ever be friends? I think that this picture perhaps says it all. Sometimes an awkward relationship, we have to work together, we have to make sure it's new technologies because it makes us innovative as companies, it makes employees more productive, there are fantastic cloud services available out there, however, we have to do this within rules to make sure that um, employees aren't inadvertently doing something that, again, going back to the Information Commissioner's uh, speech this week, he said, are either stupid or silly. So we sometimes have to make sure that we can give people the guidance for what's appropriate and what is it? Uh, before we get into what some people consider bad news, let's just look at the good news. So a survey of senior management um, conducted by the Cloud Security Alliance pointed out that the major benefits of moving to the cloud include lower upfront or ongoing costs, 
quicker to implement uh, new ideas and, uh, and new systems and a better user experience. Many of the cloud services available today are well designed. They are easy for a user to take up and use. I use, for instance, a system called Trello. It's not perhaps the most sophisticated cloud service in the world. It's not much more sophisticated than um, Post-it notes. However, you can share these with other people. You can allow other people to add to your Post-it notes. So you can all share across a, a global network. It's very simple, easy to use. But unfortunately, you can, if you choose, use this sharing other information. You can attach documents to it. So it's not that that cloud service itself is necessarily dangerous. It's whether or not users have been well trained to do the right thing. And that's where we bring the other side of the story in here. What are the barriers stopping us moving to the cloud? And as you can see, the two main ones every single time this question is asked are security and regulatory requirements. It does depend, of course, on your organization, which regulations you have. Um, but I think it's compute corporate security policies that's the main issue and making sure that you're not the next name on the front page of the news because somebody has inadvertently shared information in the cloud. I will just have one slide on what Sky High does, uh, in case you don't know. Sky High's job really is to try to help you make sense of cloud services that might be in use in your organization. And we know about 20,000 different cloud services, and we know all the attributes of those different services. Um, something like 50 or 60 different attributes, from technical ones to legal ones, where are they hosted, do they encrypt data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And our job is to help our customers split the cloud services that are being used into groups. Those that may be on the right-hand side of this, you want to approve, you want to support, you want your users to use. Things perhaps like Office 365 or Salesforce.com or Box or whatever it might be. You want to approve them, but you also want to make sure that you're not losing security capabilities that you might have had with your on-premises systems that you've been using for the last decade. So how can you make sure you're using them in a safe and secure way? At the same time, you have other systems that maybe you aren't so convinced about. The company doesn't want to actually pay for and have a contract with some of these systems, but you will perhaps um, at least allow them to uh, be used by users. So you'll permit them access, uh, but permit them within uh, boundaries. So you say, yes, you can use this system, but do not share any intellectual property. Do not share any customer information. Do not share information about yourself, because actually we don't fully trust them. And then perhaps there'll be systems on the left-hand side that you want to deny, that for you the risk profile is way too high um, to allow your users to use. So our job isn't to necessarily tell you which um, cloud services need to fit into which category, but help you together with the uh, professional services people at Axial to put your lists together of what's appropriate and what isn't and make sure that uh, data isn't being overshared. I don't want to talk too much about Sky High um, because there are many other ways of getting that information. So let's let's perhaps go straight on to the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, and what I want to do is take this um, from the position of what you do with today's data you've already got, how do you change what you're doing when you're collecting new data, what do you need to tell your uh, possible data subjects or users, how do you process that, are you allowed to transfer it outside the European Union, what about deleting data, and very importantly, um, what do you need to do about the potential of data loss? And actually, one of the other things I would say is we need to get a plan together right now, and it needs to be led perhaps by communications rather than IT. What is your view as an organization if data was to be lost? What are you going to do? Who's going to be the spokesperson? How are you going to communicate with the wider community and also your users, your employees, your suppliers, whose data may well have been lost? So let's go through this. So firstly, existing data. Existing data, anything we have already, it will be covered under the new regulation. And so um, you can't say, well, it's okay, I collected it 
uh, many years ago, it doesn't count. You need to look at all of your existing data and where it might be. I'm not going to go into great details about what uh, personal data is, but I will just say that it's been well defined within the new regulation as any data that can identify an individual. That's a very much more precise definition than in the previous directive, and that could therefore mean not just phone numbers, first name, last name, date of birth, ex, uh, home address, but IP address, email addresses, etc. Anything that can identify an individual. So what you need to do today, I think, is start the process of where is all of our data? What are we going to do uh, to find all of that data? We are responsible for that data, whether it is stored in a big corporate database or whether it's on individual laptops. What are we going to do to look at data that is currently moving in and out of the organization? And how are we going to put together procedures to make sure that that's done in a safe and secure manner? And this is where we bring in outsourcing. And if you look at many of the data loss incidents over the last few years that have been high profile, the data has often been lost by a third party. So with Target in the States, um, at least one of TalkTalk's Talk data loss incidents, they said, oh, it wasn't us, it, it was lost through a third party. Well, you're responsible for your third parties. You're responsible for your outsources. You're responsible for the cloud services that that data is on. You can't say it's their fault because they lost it. So what we need to do is we've now got two years to get together and work out just which third parties have our data already. Who are we working with? Do they understand their responsibilities when they are using data that we are holding? So we need to work out what our policy should be. We need to train our employees. And we do need to put in technologies to secure that data, track what's going on, report on that, because actually, a key part of conforming to the regulations is having information on which data is going where, the ability to report if a data loss incident occurred. Again, let's go back to uh, the most recent TalkTalk Talk data loss incident. There was a period of, I think, about a week or so where TalkTalk Talk didn't really know how much data had been lost, and the story became bigger than it might otherwise have been because um, some numbers were quoted that were really uh, very high in the millions. It turned out in the end not as much data was lost. So you do need the ability to do some forensics to go back in time if a data loss incident occurs and try to find out just what the scope of that is. So there's lots of things to try to put together in the next two years, even to keep track of today's data and make sure that um, you know what's going on and you've got a, a starting point. The next thing is, okay, new employees, new customers, new prospects, new suppliers. What do you do about that? And this is where I have got to say you've got to start bringing in other departments. And marketing, um, I've got marketing in my job title. I will, I will boldly say marketing are often the worst um, part of the organization for not understanding the value of data, of thinking that as soon as they have um, an email address, they can send emails to this person without asking any further questions, that they can share that information throughout the organization. The new regulation is very clear. You've got to be clear when an, a user comes to you um, why you're collecting their data. You've got to give the user the ability to opt in to that collection. The information must be clear. You can't hide it in a 47-page end-user license agreement and you can't automatically opt people in. You must only use the data for the purpose it was collected for. So let's think, if you say to somebody, um, I'm going to, I'd like your contact details so that I can give you technical support on the product that you have purchased, that doesn't give you the right to, to then try to use that to sell them something else. So marketing have got to be involved here to try to work out exactly what wording to you put on your website when people come to um, interact with your organization? What wording do you put um, on any other marketing that you might be uh, uh, taking place? And this one's interesting. It's, there's a line that says, you must not demand an opt-in 
and you must not restrict users' access to a service on the basis that they only get it if they opt in. Well, that's interesting because virtually every IT company that I know says, yes, you can have access to the data sheets, that's fine. If you want access to an in-depth white paper, you need to give me your contact details. The strict reading of this regulation would be that actually that's illegal. So we do need to talk to the marketing department. We certainly need to talk to legal and work out what we're going to put on our website so that we conform to the law um, and yet can still um, do business. And then the other thing that marketing people do is they hold on to data forever. Um, I'm still getting uh, emails from organizations that I first dealt with, um, oh, I don't know, decades ago. Um, and you should only keep the data for the length of time necessary to conduct the business transaction that the data was collected for. So once that's been done, you should have a, a system that purges data. And honestly, I don't know many organizations that uh, purge their data um, until they get to a point where they're sending emails and they're bouncing back. So you do need to work out what that is going to be as well. Well, once you've got the data, how can you process it? So a few interesting things here that sort of come together into one place. So um, you'll also guess from this presentation by the end of it that users are in control. The data subject, as the law is defined, or perhaps users, as I'm calling them, can demand all sorts of things of a data controller, someone who has that data. They can demand that their data be withdrawn. How do you do that? How do you actually remove someone from all the different databases that you might have that user in? Um, I know very well a, uh, a bank that I've been dealing with for many years as a customer. I've been a customer of their credit cards, of their um, current account, of their insurance. And uh, I know some people who work there who say, all of these systems are completely different. None of them are joined together. So if I, as a user, demanded that they delete my data, what would they do? You need to work that out. You need to be able to answer that question, and you need to be able to delete that data if that user says so. And I think one other thing that is very obvious, if you look at some of the most, uh, uh, the largest of the data loss instances, is you've got to ask yourself a question. Why did some of these users have access to all that data in one go? Consider access management to restrict the quantity of data available to each individual. Sky High isn't a very large organization, but in our CRM system, I can only see data for organizations in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. So there is a limit to how much data I personally can lose. I think that quite often we find systems where somebody uh, just sets up access to the system, and once you've got access, you've got access to everything. So the more you can restrict access to data, of course, the less that can potentially be lost by an individual. And encrypting data um, obviously can significantly reduce the risk of data loss. We've been encrypting USB sticks and laptops for many years. There's encryption on uh, all uh, mobile phones nowadays. But what about encrypting data before it's saved into a cloud service? Encrypting data in the uh, general systems in house only be decrypted at the point at which the user proves who they are and gets access to the keys and keeping the keys within your organization I could say there's not much point in encrypting data in a cloud service if the keys are also kept in the same cloud service it would be great wouldn't it to be able to say yes I've encrypted all the data before it's saved in Google Drive box Dropbox office 365 whatever it might be but all of the keys are being kept locally. That way, as soon as the data leaves your individual's devices and starts going up to the cloud, it is already encrypted. It's already got a layer of security. And going back to uh, outsourcers, the phrase that the um, regulation uses about people who are outsourcers is they're called data processes. So if you are an organization such as Sky High that collects data on individuals, we are a data controller. If we outsource it to Salesforce, Salesforce are a data processor. Data processors and data controllers are jointly liable if data gets lost. And 
you need to ensure that your data processors understand their liability. And quite likely, if they're um, a relatively small organization and if they're outside the European Union, they probably won't know exactly what their liability is, but they need to know, they need to sign up to you, uh, probably uh, a legal contract that says, um, I understand and I will treat data fairly and uh, with the security that you want. And actually, I'll just say a little um, point before I move on. Um, if they support ISO 27018, that's a great standard to show that they understand their responsibilities when um, dealing with uh, personal data in the cloud. Okay. Now this slide I could probably talk about for three hours, which is a bit of a problem. Um, transferring data outside the European Union. Um, there's a few things that I think are interesting. Transfers should only occur if necessary. It was a late addition to the regulation. I think it's an interesting one. Um, and actually, the commercial world has shown quite a bit ago when we looked at the 20,000 cloud services that we knew, if I remember the numbers, only about 20% of them or less stored data in the European Union. But when we did the same review in December of last year, that had more than doubled. So there are lots of global cloud service providers where you can say to them, yes, I'd like to use your system, I'd like to be a customer, but I'd like your data to be pinned into the European Union. I want it to be saved in your European Union uh, data storage. Now, from a legal point of view, transfer happens as soon as the data leaves, and users should be informed that data might leave the European Union and allow them to opt out. Now, I don't think anybody wants a web page with 10 or 12 different boxes where they click, yes, I do allow this, but no, I don't allow that. But you should be telling them if you are using an outsourcer or cloud service. And um, there are 11 countries outside the European Union that the EU currently consider have adequate privacy laws, and it's okay to transfer data there. You can get a list of them from the EU website, but uh, they include places like um, Uruguay, New Zealand, um, Israel, then of course Liechtenstein, Norway, and Switzerland that are part of the uh, European Economic Area, but not the EU. But it does not include the US. Um, so for transfer to any other country, Really, there should be a legal contract with the recipient, the data processor, that um, the data processor confer confirms to you that they will um, treat the data safely and securely. And um, most big cloud service providers that are dealing with enterprises have clauses in their contracts that make that point. But the responsibility keeps going. If you outsource and they outsource to someone else and that person outsources to somebody else, the responsibility for data security follows the data. Every organization in the chain is responsible, but honestly, if data gets lost, it's the data controller that's going to be in the news, it's the data controller that's going to have to take the lead in uh, trying to investigate it and understand it. It's the data controller that will probably bear the brunt of the problems. One last point. the. Um, as you probably know, late last year, Safe Harbor Scheme was um, struck down by the European courts as not being adequate for uh, data transferred from the European Union to the US. The um, EU-US Privacy Shield has been put in place. However, it's not yet fully operational, and feel free to Google Privacy Shield, and you will see there's lots of different opinions on this, whether it is sufficient or whether it will also be struck down. So I think. Um, Honestly, it's probably not the best mechanism to use from a legal point of view to ensure safety. Though, again, the Information Commissioner this week when talking said he's not going to spend his time looking for people who are using Safe Harbor and Privacy Shield to simply um, to um, pull them up on it. But of course, uh, he would take that into account if any data is, is lost, if um, the systems weren't adequate. Sorry if this seems to be moving towards the legal rather than the IT space, and that might not have been what you were expecting. But I make the point again that I made at the beginning, that actually this is a big issue that needs to be addressed by multiple organizations um, in your, sorry, multiple departments in your organization. So let's move on a little bit, deleting data. Um, so 
I did say users can demand data be deleted. Data should also be de deleted if it's not needed any longer. What's your process? How do you ensure deletion from all data stores? Um, I personally, two companies ago, um, received an email from uh, somebody who actually worked for a business partner who said, I don't want to receive your uh, emails anymore. Please remove them from your lists. Uh, we tried to, but funnily enough, he kept bouncing back, partly because he kept going back to our website, but it was automatically opting him back in. So it's not as easy as it might sound. And if you have to delete people from the big corporate database, how do you also ensure that all of the employees delete them, that person from their own devices? Um, if someone is using a spreadsheet, how do you make sure that that's kept up to date? So there is a lot of work to be uh, uh, gone into around processes and how you will conform to this, not just technology. And then data loss. Okay, you think you've had a breach. How do you know? How do you investigate it? Um, what do you do? How did you find out? Again, going back to my good friend's uh, talk talk, and just to let you know, I'm currently a customer of theirs. Um, when they lost data in October um, 2014, they didn't know. They didn't know until scammers started phoning their customers, claiming to be talk talk, and trying to uh, get people to um, uh, to pay money because of uh, what they said was um, infections on their devices. And, and so they didn't have a system that knew that data had been lost. They um, then had to work out, well, what data had been lost? What do I do about it? And it took them, um, as a customer, I didn't receive my email saying your data might have been lost until March 2015. That's five months after the data was lost. The new regulation says you have 72 hours to tell the regulator if you know you've had a data breach and that users must be informed without undue delay. You see I put that in speech marks. I'm sure lawyers can argue that for quite a long time. I don't know how long without undue delay is, but I'm sure it's not five months. Um, so how do you communicate to your data subjects if data has been lost? How does that happen? When? Who owns it? How do you do it? What do you offer them if you offer them anything? How do you apologize in a way that keeps your brand um, seen as positive um, and uh, doesn't cause you additional problems because the communication itself is not very good. There's some great news in the regulation. It actually talks about encryption. It talks about um, pseudonymization. Uh, it talks about um, trying to mitigate some of the problems and actually says that um, certainly for informing users, if the data is encrypted, then it is not considered necessary to inform the users of data loss. Because actually, once it's been encrypted, it's not personal data any longer. Assuming that somebody can't decrypt that uh, without coming back to you as the data processor and getting your keys, then encryption can really help. So have a look at that technology that maybe will uh, reduce your risks quite dramatically. I've watched a number of other webinars on this subject, and one of them that I watched spent probably 45 minutes talking about maintaining records. And it is very clear from the Information Commissioner that record keeping is really important. Um, I won't read all of these out, but I, I will go back to uh, the example this week. Um, that one of the reasons the fine was so large was because that organization had performed the same error uh, what, I think eight years ago. The Information Commissioner at that point didn't find them, but they went in and they talked to them, and they talked to them about better processing, and they talked to them about record keeping. And so the reason that the fine is so large this time around was there wasn't good record keeping. They didn't really know what had happened. And um, it's very clear that the authorities who are investigating any data breach will want to look at your record keeping, look at what pro policies, what processes, what education you have for your users. So let's put all that together. Let's make sure that we've got a robust set of policies to make sure that uh, if anything does go wrong, um, we have record keeping, we know exactly what happened. I will just uh, point out why um, I think the cloud is so important with a few slides. I won't go into too many, but um, here's a report that was published in March 2016 by McAfee. 
What McAfee did was they asked um, senior decision makers in the IT space, especially in IT security, how many cloud services they thought were in use across multiple countries. And they produced this graph, where as you can see, um, in the UK we believe we have 29 cloud services. In Brazil, we believe we've got 55 cloud services, the average being 43. So maybe you're all sitting there thinking, yeah, that sounds about right. Probably in my organization we have um, 20, 30, 40, 50 cloud services. What's really scary is this is what people believe is going on. Meanwhile, we at Sky High publish a cloud adoption and risk report every six months or so based on real-life data. This is based on statistics that we gather from our customers and we know how many cloud services they're accessing. So while we may ask you how many cloud services you've got and you say 20, 30, 40, the actual numbers are more like 500, 600, 700, 1000. In fact, the highest number that we have seen in Europe is 6,000 different cloud services being used in one organization. And I do mean different. So if you and I and three other people were all using Dropbox, as far as this statistic is concerned, that will be counted as one. So I don't know how many of us can actually name 1,038 cloud services, but the average cloud services in a European organization right now is above 1,000. It's many times more than the number that IT think, and it's many times more than the number that IT have officially approved. And of course, not all of them are dangerous, not all of them are scary, not all of them have got personal information in them, but it is our responsibility to know what's going on. It is our responsibility to be able to make sure that that data is being kept safe and secure once it's there. And a couple of other slides, I won't go through every piece, but just to let you know, these are the sorts of statistics, the sort of attributes that Sky High can help you use to evaluate whether or not a cloud service is appropriate for your use or not. Um, the one on the, there at the top left, does the customer own all data uploaded? You'll be shocked to see perhaps that more than 50% of cloud services claim that when data is uploaded, they own that data. Um, if you remove um, a service, if you terminate it, um, is the data deleted immediately? Well, not always. Uh, do they encrypt data at rest? Absolutely not always. In fact, less than 10% of them do. Many of these things, happily, can be added to the cloud service. So there's technologies from us and other people that can allow you to add some of the security features if they're not a standard part of the system. But it is worth realizing that not all cloud services are the same, some are very good, some are absolutely designed for enterprise use, some are uh, less well defined and, um, and therefore may be a problem. So three slides on some of the ways that, that we can help um, before I then move to, to what I recommend our, our next steps are. Um, you know, Firstly, you can't manage something if you don't know what's going on, if you can't see it, if you haven't got visibility. We can help you track the cloud services that your users are using. We can give you an assessment of those, which services have which of these security capabilities, how much information is being uploaded and downloaded, and data leak prevention of those files going up and down. If they are corporate files, let's investigate them. What's inside those files? Oh, look, this file is just a letter, that's fine, doesn't seem to have any personal information in. This file, customers.xls, seems to have an enormous number of email addresses in it. That's the sort of thing that really, perhaps, should be tracked, should be controlled, should be perhaps even deleted from the cloud service if that's not an appropriate place to keep it. Let's look at the users. Let's look and see whether, uh, as the example I gave earlier, a lot of the users have got complete access to all of the systems. They're a privileged user because that's just easier to do and therefore they've got too much access to too much content. Where is the data being stored? Uh, we found a, uh, a company that designs military equipment and they were using some cloud services that were based in countries that, may I say, were perhaps not the most friendly to the UK. Um, is that okay? 
Uh, perhaps not. So, you know, let's let's look at whether that's an issue for you. And then, you know, have they got the compliance that you uh, expect, such as ISO 27001, ISO 27018, uh, all the different um, uh, conformance that they might have. Have they encrypted data? If not, can we add encryption before the data is uh, is uploaded? Um, also, the other thing to remember is that quite often cloud services are just a stepping stone. Let me give you my little um, Dropbox story for this one. So, a couple of companies ago, I had something like 700 or so um, people I was dealing with who are either resellers of mine, uh, PR agencies, event organizers, graphics design agencies, etc. And rather than sending them all um, the logo of the company that I worked for and um, PDFs of documents, etc. I set up a Dropbox account and I simply gave these 700 people access to this directory and I just kept on putting things in that directory. None of it was really, as far as I was concerned, um, very sensitive. Um, it would maybe be Word versions of a PDF file and as I say, lots of different flavors of the logo. Okay, so what happened? my German PR agency was working on a press release and it had lots of graphics on it and so they decided that the way they would share it with Nigel was to upload it to my Dropbox directory so that I could then see it and then sent me an email saying this is the file, uh, these are the graphics that go with it, can you approve this press release before it's sent out? What they didn't realize was that they then shared it not only with me but with 698 people and the way Dropbox worked at that point you could easily turn it on so that any time a new document is put into the directory that you're sharing, it automatically gets synced down to your devices. They shared private information that had not yet been made public with 700 people, most of them outside the organization. The question is, whose fault is it? I haven't gone away. Whose fault is it? Is it their fault, the PR agency? Is it my fault? because I didn't tell them what to do, what not to do. Is it my IT's fault because they hadn't put in policies and procedures? Is it Dropbox's fault because they created a system that was so open? And of course the answer is probably in the end it was my fault. Um, happily Dropbox is a little more sophisticated now, you can give people read-only access, there's all sorts of capabilities, but you've got to start educating your users about what's an appropriate use of cloud services and what isn't. And one of the things that we can do is we can help you know which external organizations are actually sharing the cloud links that you might be sending out. Meanwhile, you've probably read the rest of the points. Um, you know, we can tell you about strange things, for instance, an employee that uh, logs in usually from various sites in the UK, all of a sudden pops up from China. Uh, that's weird, that's strange. Has this person ever been in China before? How come they managed to get from London to China in two hours? This is a possible uh, infection of a device or um, a disgruntled employee, somebody who over a period of a year usually downloads only a certain amount of data per week and all of a sudden on a Sunday night starts um, uploading or downloading enormous amounts of traffic. Strange things that may well be fine but probably need to be investigated. Okay, so what do you need to do to implement the GDPR? I believe you need a cross-functional team, perhaps a, a cloud adoption team on the cloud, but a GDPR team for sure. You need to get legal advice. There's lots of lawyers who can help you that you can look at your privacy policy, look at whether you need to change any of that. And the cloud evaluation team really does need to be much more than IT. If you're sitting there as an IT person thinking that you're suffering from uh, somebody pointing the finger at you and saying you're responsible for this, really I don't think that's good enough. It needs to involve, as you can see, legal, compliance, finance, HR, employees, all sorts of different groups that need to come together and work out what your stance is, how you're going to deal with this regulation because it's serious, it's significant and you've got two years before it comes into force. We need to look at employee communication. Um, always the weakest link on any system is the employees. Not usually malicious employees, frankly. It is usually people who inadvertently lose data without realizing what they're doing. And this 
cloud evaluation team needs to be able to look at cloud services, decide which ones you want to support, which ones you don't want to support, uh, keep everything under review. In more detail, perhaps, they need to set minimum standards for the cloud services. So you might say, I don't want this organization to share any data in cloud services hosted in, in the name of country. Or you might say, I only want to share um, financial data in cloud services that conform to this standard. Whatever that standard might be, you need to define it. You can't implement technology to keep this in check unless you know what those standards are. And then start migrating users to the services you like. We typically find um, anything between 40 and 100 different cloud data storage services. I've mentioned some of them already. So Box, Dropbox, Office 365, um, Google Drive are just some. There are so many. You don't want to block the ones you've heard of because you'll push your users to the ones you've never heard of, which are probably even more dangerous. But if you pick one that you think the organization trusts, um, sign a contract with them. Make sure that they understand the importance of the data that's been um, being stored in there. You can then start to migrate your users. You can send them splash pages that say, ah, ah Nigel, you're going to Dropbox. Actually, our corporate standard is Box. We'd really like you to use this because uh, we've got a contract with them. You have unlimited access. We're doing DLP on it. Um, we believe this is the safest and most secure cloud service. It's something that we want the whole company to use. Um, all data is being um, logged, and please use that one. Click here to, to set up an account. Box is only an example, obviously. It could be whatever you choose from a commercial point of view. So start publishing your approved cloud services list, and users will migrate typically to the cloud services you want them to use. Then you've got a much easier uh, set of uh, actions to take. You only need to uh, be tracking a relatively small number of cloud services. And then, but the good news is that um, you can add lots of the capabilities to cloud services that perhaps um, only some of them have as uh, a standard part of their services. So things like single sign-on. Um, really great, for instance, when I left my last company, the day after I left, access to all of their systems had disappeared because it was all um, delivered by a single sign-on. The IT department was able to press one button and delete Nigel from uh, the email system, from Salesforce, from uh, GoToMeeting, from Marketo, et cetera, et cetera. All of these different services being controlled in one place. Um, meanwhile, again, you've probably read on with that. Um, there are lots of things you can add to cloud services if you don't think they offer all of the services that you want out of the box. I will just finish with a, a final thought, um, two thoughts actually. Um, this might sound hard and it might sound, you might be sitting there feeling a little depressed that this sounds like a lot of work. Well, it's supposed to be and I, I think it's fair because if you look at the last 10 years, it's been a, a list of disasters every few days as somebody somewhere loses data and the amount of data getting lost seems to be just increasing. But if we think about our own data, data on ourselves, data on our children, we want that to be treated fairly. We want that to be kept safe and secure. Yes, okay, the ball's on the other foot when we're controlling other people's data, but we need to consider that it's like ours. Or maybe this one makes the point even more. Is this your car? Anybody on the phone got a car like that? Uh, well, me neither. But what if one of your friends has got a car like that and he or she lends it to you. And you go, wow, fantastic, I'd love to have that. Um, and then another friend of yours says, oh, could I borrow that car? And you go, yeah, yeah, I've got it for the day, but you know, you can have it for a couple of hours. And they then drive it, and then they crash it. Who's at fault? What do you do? Do you go back to the person who owned the car and say, well, actually, it wasn't me, because I lent it on to somebody else. And the person who owns the car said, I didn't give you the authority to lend that to someone else. It's not your car. It's also not your data. As far as the European Union is concerned, the data subjects own their data. It is only ever on loan to you. So don't ever say, my database, my data in my system. It's not your data. 
it's someone else's data. It is the data of the individual. As I said earlier, they can demand that you delete it. They can demand it be updated. Actually, they can also demand that you give it back to them. So perhaps I go to my bank that I said I've banked with for many years. I will have the authority and the right to say to them, I would like electronically all the data that you have on me because I want to give that to another bank. And I want them to be able to see the whole credit history that I've had. Please give it to me. So again, another question. How on earth do you answer that question? How do you give them their data back if that's what they demand? So I think if you think of this car throughout this process, if you think of the fact that the data you're being given is incredibly valuable to the person whose data it is, and treat it in a way that you would treat that car. You hopefully don't lend it to someone who's going to crash it immediately into a tree and you won't go far wrong. There's various materials available to you to get more information. Um, the ebook that I mentioned is available there, um, and we'll be sending all of these links. There's also a webinar replay of an earlier webinar. Um, there's a blog that uh, we've written. There's an infographic. The infographic might be useful to share with any of your colleagues who don't think that GDPR matters. It's not an infographic that gives you the whole uh, 200 um, page law because I couldn't do that, but actually it's an infographic which basically answers the question, why should I care? Um, I've spoken a bit longer than uh, I anticipated, but I think we've got uh, about 10 minutes to go. Um, I'm now going to take uh, a little break and see if there are any uh, questions um, and answer them for you. But um, of course, thank you very much for attending and uh, very happy to share all of the slides that I've used. If you think that it would be useful for us to share this information with other people in your organization, I know that Axial are recording this and will make it available, but I'm also quite interested in talking to people, having round tables with different departments to try to um, help you define what your policies will be. So meanwhile, let's just look at the questions. Um, yeah, can Sky High tell me what content is in the file as it's being sent to the cloud similar to DLP? Um, yes, it can. Um, it, it does depend on the cloud service and the way that they work with us, but some of the, um, especially the enterprise-ready cloud services such as um, Salesforce, Box, Office 365, they have a capability that we hook into which allows us to be actually what's called a reverse proxy. So we are in front of that cloud service we can therefore um, implement rules that you might set up, and those rules can be things like doing a DLP uh, scan of the data. Um, and yes, aha, uh -huh. so a, a great question here actually, which is can Sky High tell me about content of files that may have already been transferred to the cloud? Yes, absolutely. In fact, it's one of the key things to do because it's not as if we're starting from zero. Um, one of the first things that many of our, um, our customers say to us is, I know people are already using, let's take uh, uh, Dropbox as an example, let's have a review of what's there. And the great thing is that many of the enterprise cloud services are implementing APIs that companies like us can uh, work with. Sometimes we've actually helped them write their APIs, and these APIs allow us, if we, if our system is set up with your management um, login name and password to be able to look at the existing files that have been uploaded and perform a DLP scan on them. I've got another question which is, um, if we vote for Brexit in the UK, will all this go away? Um, well, uh, I think the quick answer to that really is probably no. Uh, why? Well, if you want to do business with the European Union, which might at that point be 27 countries in tw instead of 28, you will still have to conform to this. And actually, this is a global law. This affects anybody who has data on individuals who are resident in the European Union. So it even affects US companies um, or any company anywhere in the world who has data on European individuals. So I think actually um, uh, you'll find that you have to conform to this whether we vote for Brexit or not. And actually, I'm sure that even if we did vote for Brexit, the UK government would want to be considered a safe place to do business for European individuals. And so um, 
even if not the exact same law, an equivalent law would have to be passed so that the European Union was happy with the data privacy that we might put in place. So I actually think it will make absolutely no difference whatsoever. So I think a few minutes before, if you've got any further questions, feel free to type them into the question box. Otherwise, again, I'd like to um, thank you for listening to me, and I'll pass back to, um, to Lucy to do uh, a bit of a wrap-up. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Nigel. That was very interesting. Um, thank you, everyone, very much for your time. Um, the details are up, as you can see. Um, and um, we will be in contact to see if anyone would like any further information. Thank you very much.